Uh, my name is Skip Brown. Uh, I have a little consulting business called Asphalt Consulting Services. We have come across better systems for maintaining our road services, I believe, than just paving every 10 or 12 years, 15 years. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. This picture here shows uh, a road that I paved in 1982, and Petromat was new on the market at the time. And I convinced the uh, agency to uh, try it out. The thing was is they didn't have enough money to do the whole road. So I did one lane. Now this picture was taken 20 years later, and you cannot tell which lane that I put the Petromat on, but it happened to be this lane here. But within five years, the cracks are all the way across the pavement. It didn't make any difference. It, it just didn't do much of a job for crack reflection. The following year, in 1983, I applied uh, what we now call a geosynthetic reinforced chip seal, which is a combination of pavement fabric underneath the double chip seal. This was my first job. We made some mistakes. We, we had a learning curve, but it worked out pretty well. So I'll get back to these later. I'm going to move up to 1996 when I was called to Clear Lake, California. They asked me about this road, and I suggested you should tear it out. This is way beyond what I thought this would work. Uh, on this particular road here, I had the same answer, which was, no, you need to tear this out. The cracks are way too big. There's too many of them. Um, I didn't feel that it would be suitable for this, this particular road either. Now, when we got to this one, uh, I said I can fix this road. And the reason I felt I could fix it was because there was no vertical distortion in the road any place. It was smooth, it was old and grade. Uh, what we had was old, tired, probably 30 years old, cracked pavement, alligator cracking everywhere. And I felt it would be uh, suitable for the, uh, the reinforced ship seal. So how do we do this process? Uh, the first thing that you would do would be to uh, skin patch the irregular surfaces. Now, if you're going to go out and dig out, repair this road, you would dig the whole road out because it's all cracked up. But in this town, which is the town of Williams, California, the water table is between 12 and 18 inches below the surface. And so if you took off the surface, you would fall through the base and uh, the road would fail. So you skin patch the surface to smooth it up, kind of like this on this road, also in the town of Williams. We actually just drug a thin lift over it with a paving machine just to smooth it up, take care of the potholes. So the placement of the interlayer is, is the critical aspect of the GRCS process. You have to apply enough binder to saturate the fabric or the mat that you're using and that will vary upon the products that you're using. And you immediately roll that fabric or mat with a pneumatic tire roller in order to bring the oil right up through while it's hot because it cools very fast. Now that will involve some sprayers on the tires and you're going to need a suitable parting agent, which I won't go into at this time. There's a number of them available on the market or you can just try soap and water if you want, but that's not my recommendation. So here's another place up in a little town called Camino, California, where it's showing here the interlayer that's down and the rolling of it, which is bringing the binder up through it. Uh, this brown area here is the asphalt emulsion, which was applied for the chip spreader. The boot truck has gone to reload and the uh, spreader is waiting for him to come back. Another uh, place was Clear Lake, California, uh, where we put this down, and this shows good interlayer embedment. Again, you see all the binder coming up through the, the interlayer here, um, and it's, it's going to be ready for your chip seal. And the reason I say that this is critical is because if you don't saturate the interlayer with the binder that holds it in place, then a portion of your emulsion when you apply your chips is going to go into the interlayer. Now, we all know that the ability to hold chips is all about film thickness. And 
if you lose some film thickness by saturation into the inner layer, you won't have enough to hold the chips and they will later come off. So the film th thickness again is all about the size of the chip and whether or not you get any absorption into your inner layer. Here's an airport up in a little town called Swansboro um, in El Dorado County, California. And they wanted to pave it, but they couldn't afford it. And I said, well, the, it's moving underneath loading conditions. And if you brought that much, that many tons of asphalt in on top of this airport, you're going to destroy it. So we went ahead with the, this process, even though I really don't care for chips on an airport. I've done a couple of airports. Uh, by demand because they needed something that was going to hold the surface together for more than three or four years. They had been slurry sealing this and after three or four or five years it would be cracked up and they would have to start over again. If you're going to put traffic on it or if you're planning on placing the chip seal the same day that you place the inner layer, you're probably going to have to sand it in order to blot it, and that is purely to absorb the excess binder that comes out to the top. So here's your first course of chips going down at Clear Lake, California, and you'll notice here this strip of oil down the edge. Uh, any good chip seal contractor knows that you make sure that you leave a strip of oil of which to tie the t two layers uh, of chips, the two lanes together. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to be oiling over the top of chips that may not be adhered to the binder, and that will be a failure down the road also. This picture shows a 14% grate. They asked me if I could put this on a 14% grate, and um, I came in with my patent, ans patent answer, uh, I don't know. Uh, if you had asked me when I was 25 or 30, I of course knew all the answers. But as I got a little bit older, I discovered I didn't. So I always said, I don't know. We'll give it a try. Uh, it worked very well. We were unable to pull the, the chip truck here with the chip spreader on this grade. Uh, we had to put some in the hopper and run up the hill and stop and back up and do this several times. Here's another airport. This was a private strip over in the, near Esparto, California and it was on some expansive soils and there was some severe cracking opening up in the neighborhood of three quarters of an inch wide. And they asked me if this would assist with that and I said, yeah, it would. Uh, but a lot of the airport was in good shape and no cracks. And I said, well, why don't we just interlayer only the crack pavement? And as you can see, we put a chip seal over the crack pavement, over the interlayer. You can see the areas where we had interlayer where we did the chip seal. Uh, and then we put a single seal over the whole job, which provided the double on the inner layer and a single on the balance of the airport. Sometime in the late 90s, I believe it was, or early 2000s, I was, I was uh, brought down to uh, Baghdad, Arizona. When they first mentioned Baghdad, I said, I'm not going to Baghdad. And they said, no, 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 this is Arizona. It's almost as hot and it's a lot more friendly. Um, there's a mining town down there by the name of Baghdad, and their streets were 35 years old and completely ignored and all cracked up, but they were holding together, and they asked me if it would work, and I said, of course it would. Uh, if the street is holding together under the traffic, the cracks don't bother me. So here's the first chip over the inner layer down at Baghdad. On this street was their main hall street coming out of the mine, and it was cracked pretty badly and they wanted to overlay that street. And I suggested we put the GRCS underneath the overlay uh, to forestall crack reflection. The results I got five years later were it's holding up very well. None of the cracks are reflecting. We key cut the edges against the curb and gutter sidewalks just like you would for an overlay, put down the GRCS, and then followed up with the paving over the top of that. So if you don't put an inner layer down underneath pavement, we know what's going to happen. The cracks are coming through. This happens to be six years old. I, I paved this street in 96. And as you can see, this uh, picture was taken in 2002. And the cracks are already coming through everywhere. So th the result of paving over cracks is foregone conclusion. Um, 
Uh, they, they're going to propagate through at the rate of about an inch a year. You put down a two inch overlay and inside of two or three years you're going to start to see the cracks and in six years they're going to be out that wide. Now here is a racetrack up out of Wirtles, California. That they use a very tough oil. They use a PG76-22 built specially for this racetrack because they wanted a, a very tough asphalt so it would withstand all the racing on hot, on hot days. Well, they cracked in five months. And I was brought in to determine the cause of the cracking. I said, well, it's a reflective cracking from underneath. And the owner said, there were not any cracks in this racetrack before you paved it. And I said, well, cut a core, you'll see them. And they cut a core, and it was. So five months with the best oil that they can build for your asphalt. So that's the result. Here's a core I took on an overlay that was eight years old that was on top of a, a pavement fabric over the top of cracks underneath. And you can see the result of that. We have better products now. We've got some high tensile strength uh, mats and composite grids with fiberglass that do a lot better job for cracking. But it's still, it's a very expensive process. So look at some of the before and after photos. This was a street in 96 that they wanted to take out within the next two to three years. And they asked me if this process would hold up that long. And I said, yeah, it'll hold up two or three years and probably a lot longer. Well, this was after seven years later at the, on this street in uh, Gardnerville, Nevada. That's at 4,000 feet elevation. Uh, here's a couple of pictures of before and after. See the rock in this picture, I, I try to get a picture because they paint houses and it may not be the same color, but I can get back to the same rock anyway. And you see this uh, valve here, which is in this picture over here, and you see the alligator cracking in this area, which nothing was done to it. We just put down the GRCS right on top of that. And as you can see here, after seven years, uh, it's holding up very well. And what's very interesting is this picture, which is after 17 years, this picture was taken in 2013. The job was done in 96. They never did replace the street. They haven't replaced it to this day. And you can see the re reflecting symbols of the cracks here in the alligator area and some of the others that are starting to open up. And I was uh, th there in 2013 and they asked me what they might do to that street. And I said, well, um, gosh, this process lasted 17 years. If you do it again, they'll probably give you 17 more. So I'm not too sure. I don't, I don't think to this day they've done anything to the street. They're still running on that same GRCS applied back in 96. So this is a South Lake Tahoe. This is at 6,000 feet. This is uh, their state line. And they had this alligator area pretty badly there. We plugged these holes with some asphalt. We didn't do anything about the alligator pavement here. And seven years later, with all the chains and snow plows on this area, it's still holding up very well. Uh, chains and snow plows will take this off, just like it'll take the surface off of asphalt, hot mix asphalt. Um, but this is showing that this holds up very well in those conditions. So we'll go back to Clear Lake, California. This is where I said this process will work just fine. And we put it down, and this was 10 years later. And the process is still working just fine. At the top of that 14% grade was a, a resident told me there was a spring that popped up every year and it popped up in the winter time and I said well it's going to bubble this uh, this interlayer and when you see the bubble come out with a sharp knife and cut away the bubble. So they did 10 years later the process on top of this alligator pavement is holding up just fine, it's working fine. Here's where water comes out every year, runs out this little hole right here. Um, water will strip this off. So if you're going to use this process, you want to be very careful about seeing to it that your ditches are good along the edges of your road, that they drain the water away from your, your pavement area because this will pull water underneath it like all pavements will. So this is where I told them that don't, we don't want to do this here. They said, no, no, I'll put your magic process down. Uh, we did drag a little asphalt on top of the areas where the asphalt was gone. Um, just little skin patches. Did nothing here. Uh, two years later, it 
looked just like that, which was they were happy with. And so they overlaid it with asphalt. Here was the before, and they overlaid it on the third year with asphalt, uh, hot mix asphalt. And here's the result after 10 years, showing that these cracks were not reflecting through. So that's where I begin to find out how valuable this was for ease as an underlayment for overlays if you want to repave later, or like we did down in Baghdad, Arizona, where they repaved the same summer we put it down. So here's your overlay on that absolutely destroyed street after 10 years. It's a fine street. There's nothing wrong with it. If you want it black, paint it black. At the airport at Swansboro, they're up at uh, 3,000 feet. They get snow in the winter. They want the snow off, and the best way to keep snow off the pavement is to have black pavement. And so when we got done with this project here, we uh, put in a, a fog seal on top of it to uh, give them the black color they wanted. I'm going to move into a little bit different subject matter now, uh, what we're attempting to solve currently, uh, and that's thermal cracking. This is back up in Douglas County, uh, Nevada, which is uh, actually out of Gardnerville. And this street was paved, and 15 years later it was paved again using fat fabric underneath. And 10 years after that, we're getting the thermal cracks starting to come through. And their fix for that was is to cut this crack out and patch it and then overlay it with some more fabric. And I said, well, insanity is the definition of doing something over and over again and expecting a different result. Uh, I said, we need to try something different. Um, we, we can patch a, a thermal crack. Here's an example here where a thermal crack was patched. And then you can see where it's widening out again. Uh, that little red mark there is my pocket knife, which is about three inches, which was about the width of this crack on this side. And this one on this side was about an inch and a half. So I guess we could patch it. But then again, how often do you want to patch these? Because here's the original patch for the crack. And then they came back later and they patched these little edges here and it's pulling apart some more. Now, where it's going, I don't know. I've never measured a road to understand where the road is going when they crack like this, but they'll crack about every 50 to 75 feet uh, apart and they'll be transverse across the road. And so my theory here was is, well, why don't we add some more cracks to the road and make them only 15 feet apart by saw cutting and then sealing instead of having a large amount of movement every 50 to 75 feet, we'd have smaller movements in each individual crack, which I felt that the GRCS would resolve. So this is a street where we tried this technique back in uh, 2013. Uh, we saw cut it and we sealed the cracks and then we put the inner down, which in this case was pavement fabric. Um, we had this curve on there, and we know how difficult it is to lay mat and, and uh, composite grids around corners. So I stayed with the pavement fabric, but we had a problem. The county filled the cracks for us before we got there, and they didn't fill them all the way to the top. You can see this area here. This is an area where it, there's a hollow spot underneath the fabric because they didn't get the cracks filled to the top. You can see right here where it wasn't filled to the top. This allowed the mat to spring under traffic loading conditions, which took the chips off. And three years later, the county was back seating the crack again. Now, I think they're gonna be done with this process now. I don't think it's going to get worse, but time will tell. Uh, this picture was taken three years after it was put down. But if you don't put the inner layer on at all, which is this same piece of road where all we put down was a double chip seal. And three years later, you can see how wide the crack is opening up again. Now recently, within the last four years, we have uh, come up with some grinding techniques using micro mills to smooth the pavement uh, before we put this process down. Uh, this was a job uh, down in uh, San Joaquin County, south of Sacramento. The county came to me and asked me how they're going to solve the cracking and heaving of the cracks on this farm to market road. Because 
every seven or eight years, it was all bumpy again because the road would crack and then the cracks would grow and it would heave the pavement uh, by the nature of the expansion contraction of the dust coming into the cracks and then squeezing underneath the pavement and they weren't sure of what to do about it. And I said, well, what we can do is we can make the road smooth by grinding it first with the micro mill. In this case, we had, I don't know, it was two or three of them on the job. Uh, this was a four footer here with a, what's called a double strike drum. A double strike drum has a three millimeter, what they call pick spacing or the spacing between the teeth. That equivalent to about an eighth of an inch. And you can see the smooth grind over on this other side here, uh, how smooth this is. Now, I will not specify, and I do a lot of specifying, that you place any type of an inner layer on top of a grind using standard teeth. Uh, a standard tooth drum is going to have a 5 8 to a 3 quarter inch, what's called pick spacing. Um, it also means that you're going to have about a 5 8 inch height between the top of the grind and the bottom of the grind. With a micro mill, you've got less than a quarter of an inch, and in this case, an eighth of an inch, uh, between the tops of the grind and the bottoms of the grind. So what's critical about that is in the application of a mat is if you have a large distance, a half to three quarters of an inch between the top of the grind and the bottom of the grind, when you apply the binder for the mat, the binder all runs to the bottom, the mat all lays on top, you don't get saturation of the mat, you don't get good uh, adherence of the mat to the road. So uh, we've been putting mat down on top of our grinds with standard tooth grinders for decades and we've had a lot of problems uh, when we grind through them later because it comes up in sheets. Um, and that is one of the major reasons why that happens. So anyway, with this situation here, what we do is we, we grind it with micro mills and uh, we ended up taking all the bumps off the road, making the road nice and smooth again. Now we've got some crack problems that we have to deal with. You can see the cracks in this photo here crossing the road and there's a lot of them. So you blow the cracks free of uh, materials and you fill them for hot pour. Uh, I prefer hot pour polymerized asphalt, especially if you're going to be underneath an overlay with asphalt concrete. Um, you could also use hot pour rubber in the situation with uh, the GRCS process, but again, I like the hot pour polymerized asphalt. So you blow the cracks free of materials and you fill them and then you apply your, your, your mat and your chip seals on top of it to complete your GRCS. So let's go back to the first job and compare these two. Cost to install an overlay on top of fabric is going to run 250 to $3 a square foot. That's today's prices in 2018. Depending, of course, upon how many manholes you have to raise, uh, how many, whether you have curb and gutter that you have to grind against, and those uh, other costs. The cost to install GRCS is about a third that amount. The pavement over the fabric was on this side, and the chip seal over the fabric was on the other side. Same road, same conditions, same cracks, and this is where they come together. So you can see here's a crack coming in through the GRCS process and it stops. That's after 25 years. Now, I don't know whether anybody else has come up with anything that lasts that long, but I haven't seen it. And I've been in this industry now pushing 60 years and um, I, I keep an eye on what's new and what's coming out and I haven't seen anything that even compares for longevity and for cost. So when is the process not advisable? Where loose chips cannot be tolerated for a short period of time? Oh, like maybe a grocery store parking lot. Where water is present from beneath the surface? That is not a good idea. In traffic conditions, above 10,000 ADT combined with ambient temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, why do I give those numbers? Is because I've done it under those conditions and it's worked. If the more traffic you put on it, the less chance you have for success. 
especially the first summer. If you get through the first summer, you're going to be fine. But that first summer, you've got a lot of binder. We're talking about a gallon per square yard total binder. And if you get a lot of traffic, especially with uh, 18 kip axles, truck traffic, slow moving. On pavements with an excessive amount of tight curves, well, how do you define that? Well, you define it. Um, it's hard to pull the uh, mats around the curves. Uh, the fabric works better around curves. Um, the mat doesn't work as well because you can't stretch it. So the benefits of the GRCS extends the life of pavements approaching or beyond their useful life. Well, I've proven that. Uh, these pavements I put this on were beyond their useful life. They were essentially gone. It retards crack reflection better than any other process seen to date. I've said that for now 15, 20 years. I'm still saying it. I haven't seen anything else that stops crack reflection like this process will. It stops oxidative hardening and further deterioration of existing pavements. Can be installed on pavements where the sub base is inadequate for asphalt concrete. We've put it on a couple of airports where uh, the, it was moving so much. If you brought in all asphalt concrete for over eight, you'd have, you'd have busted it up. And the price is right. One third is cost in twice as twice the life. Maybe. <laughs>